Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lasses of Europe. I'm your host, Indonesian Mocha Lover. And right now, the Indonesian idiot, Representative Putra, is a weak man. He's a fool who ever gets in the way of things, yet if it wasn't for his cowardice and ineptitude. This new bill would have been passed by now, but it isn't. And do you know why? Because Putra is a stupid, feeble wretch who has no place in government, in fact. I'd offer his position to his wife if she wasn't, quite literally, in bed with the opposition. <laughs> President Sicarno's words shocked the skeleton press crew at his latest public appearance. What was supposed to be a routine daily rally, or just a rally, quickly escalated into a critical tangent with a prominent coalition member. The cameras rolled, the microphones recorded, and by the end of the hour, the government was in chaos. Mr. President, you need to make another appearance. <clears throat> you need to apologize for your comments. Sicarno and his advisor were alone in his office. He had locked the door to keep out the rabid politicians while he planned his next move. What's there to apologize for? Sicarno asked sharply. Everything I said was true. The advisor responded, The coalition is breaking, Mr. President. Sakarno waved a hand. It's always breaking. This will all blow over. Shouts echoed from beyond the office door. I'm not, sure, not so sure it will, Mr. President. The advisor whispered nervously. Hmm. Make an announcement. I apologize. Uh, we don't apologize here. Pucha is a piece of garbage, and it's not my fault. The coalition can't see that. Well, I do want to make sure that we keep... We have the, you know, the SKN, the Japanese-backed SKM, as well as the military on our side, because that's probably pretty important. Politicians... Don't really care for them too much. That's all right. Cool. Got a couple comes to go through. Uh, someone recommends I go back and try out Red Flood sometime, which I will. I will try Red Flood again sometime. Um, I'm not sure when, but eventually. I, I think I, yesterday I already read Fighting Back, so if you'd like to do this again, please go right ahead. So we'll go and do that. And we just have some new teachers here. Oh, political power 1.3. Not bad. Not bad. Cost, though, probably went up by at least a little bit, right? That's not too bad still. If I close out of it. Oh, it's 785. Just went up slightly. Not too bad. Victories unnumbered. Let's get some more war sports, shall we? Uh, or maybe we should do some, some of this other stuff first. Hmm. War sports pretty important. That stuff is pretty important. A change of plans. Unlocks the army trees. Yeah, I'll do victories unnumbered. And yeah, let's go ahead and... Who cares? Just spend some more money because you can. Victories unnumbered. Italy wins the Italian Turkish War. The glorious expedition we sent to eradicate communism was somewhat less glorious and eradicate less communism than expected. The people, however, must be assured that President Sukarno and the army can and will shield them from communist insurgents. A new propaganda campaign has been proposed. Radio broadcast posters and fabricated military reports will bend the truth to President Sukarno's will and wishes. The communists may not be defeated, but if the people believe they are, isn't that what isn't that what really matters here? Let's make sure we can get some really good guns. Let me get some. Uh, what is it? Some Arasakas, huh? Mitzer interaction school down. Cool. Well, I don't know sure what we're going to do with political power, but compromise with both. Hey, look at that. It's unlocked. Nice. That's again. Well, we can work with those guys. Politicians, not so much. Favorable, favorable. Looking not too bad. Not too bad. And we actually have some more stability. We still get two every week, which is not bad. Pretty awesome. We get a lot of political power, even though we have no political power. Or daily political power. Communist revolt in the Levant. A revolution in my holy land? Oh, you bet there is. And this coffee's pretty good, but fighting back. Bon Tang 1 to Tiger 47, we're in position. Copy Bon Tang calling in air support. Red movement detected on the valley. And come the light bombers, agile as the villagers swallows, sweeping low and slow. Light fire from light arms scattered through the sky. The communist guerrillas exposing their own position as abruptly as the firing squad or the firing started. The firing in one sector ends with a trail of burning orange. Tiger 47 of Bon Tang 1, Northern Village cleared, begin infiltration now. Village, there were supposed to be any village civilians. Why would Colonel Suwanto muster enough willpower to not jeopardize a mission? Napalm was a new weapon in the J Indonesian jungle and had been used a devastating effect in the thick jungles of the archipelago. As horrific as what Napalm can do to a man, the Colonel has his orders, eradicate the communists south of Samarang, and if God wills, he will obey them. He steals himself before giving the radio a reply, copy Tiger, moving out. Disoriented by several attacks and being cut off from the supplies, the communists split up a spirited but ultimately futile resistance. A white flag was tied to a branch when the commissar approached the Bon Tang for a platoon. The colonel fired a sidearm and there was silence. We're not taking prisoners today. Treason is an offense punishable by death. As he kept up, a brave face for his men. Why did he shoot him? Was he a shader? Yes, in his eyes. But in the end, he was also an Indonesian, a Javanese young man. Just like he was. In his mind, Colonel Suwanto justifies this as an act of battle and a mini, an enemy who needs to be dealt with. Until he hears the cries of women and children beyond his communist checkpoint. The Bon Tang Raider Colonel drops to his knees as he walks over the commissar's corpse, his eyes greeted with a ravine of burning village houses, surrendering, surrendering village, civilians and charred corpses. When you stare too long into the abyss, you just got to steal yourself and not feel a gosh darn thing. Cool. 
All right, a change of plan. Huh, what is that one? Did it help us? Army trees. Uh... How about we get to the welfare system first? Despite all of President Sukarno's assurances that Indonesia is standing on the cusp of an immense wealth and prosperity, the poor downtrodden masses cannot survive on words alone. The issue of welfare has developed with increasing urgency within the halls of the government in recent days. Will the state protect the least fortunate at the detriment of the other, possibly more important than ventures? Or will it stop so-called communist tyranny with the distinct possibility of creating actual communists? The decision, like all others, falls to President Sukarno. Pred uh, quid pro quo. Sukarno glances down his fingernails as he leans against the car. It was far... For above any meeting, American or not. It glances up to the blinding Indonesian sun and let its warmth wash over him. He acquiesced to himself even if it didn't feel like he needed to be here. It was just nice to get out of the palace. After an eternity of waiting, the distant roar of the engine shook Sukarno from his near slumber. About darn time, Americans, Sukarno muttered to himself, always 20 minutes behind the rest of us. The sleek, jet black motorcade himself or made itself invisible as it came over the hill. Sukarno could barely make out the man inside. Was that Arif? Impossible. He knew he went to America after the war, but the CIA? That seemed a little far-fetched concerning Sukarno's history with the boy who almost got himself killed more than once. He was more trouble than he was worth in the Tantara Nacional, but Sukarno still felt some obligation to the boy. Arif was one who had saved Sukarno's life during a PKI terrorist attack. Sukarno retrieved his sunglasses from his pocket and put them on. Well then, let's see how, how the boy's done in Hollywood with them. Hey, bung, the student man said. Long time no see. Well, that was a point, Sukarno spat. Yeah, yeah, I know. You don't want to, you don't want me around here to get it, but look, Bong, we've got some footage of you. Sukarno raised an eyebrow. Yes, and I am the president of Indonesia. I would hope that people would see me. Arif took a picture from his pocket and handed it to Sukarno. The president's face remained a straight, thin line as he stared at the image. His heart skipped a beat, but Arif would, ne would never know. Quick, Sukarno recovered, some, co recovered his composure. So they sent you to threaten me. You'll need to do better than that, I'm afraid. Sukarno scoffed and opened the door to his car. Stay in America, Arif. Sukarno slammed the door and started the engine, his picture laying beside him on the passenger seat. Wait, wait, bung, darn it. Cool. So we got the welfare system. We're going to be expanding the refineries, which would be pretty useful when you get more, uh, you know, fuel and stuff. Especially synthetic refinery. New infrastructure would be pretty nice. We could maybe make some more stuff. If hard-working Indonesian laborers are the beating heart of the economy, then the roads, train tracks, pipes, and power lines are its arteries. President Sukarno knows that if Indonesia is to be modern and the Japanese place it, placated or plaqued, and the communists and insurgents defeated, then the, strong, the infrastructure must be strong. A new initiative involving hefty government funding, cooperation with local and foreign cooperations, corporations, and a more liberal interpretation of the Romusha system will begin the long and difficult journey towards Indonesian economic prosperity. Remember, without President Sukarno, there can be no modern Indonesia. We shall all follow the President's orders. Are we making artillery? Um, maybe not. Did I put artillery here? Why do I have experimental helicopters? Uh, huh. Yeah, I don't think we want those experimental helicopters. Goodbye. Yeah, we were making artillery. Gosh darn it. So there's no point to upgrade artillery just yet, then. So, keep doing gun stuff. And anti tank stuff, shall we? <clears throat> ah, the welfare system. Ah. So, I'm not really sure if we needed all three of these. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. Oh, there goes Madagascar. Goodbye, Madagascar. So, obviously the politicians we can't help out, but the SKA and the military, with Japan's backing, we should do okay. Right? That's a lot of political power that we don't have. That's alright. Oh, hello. Am I seeing a sliver of purple there? You see the grass is cool. Burgundian system led by Abdul Widodo. Nice. Ah, infrastructure. Love it. Hey, 6% stability. Not bad. I wonder what our max cap is right now. How big of a net? The last discussion was one where if Sukarno did not weigh in on their favor, it could mostly be shrugged off with nothing more than the disgruntled complaints from the respective parties. The current discussion was a dangerous tightrope to walk. Sukarno's gaze, way, gaze swayed from side to side as each member nervously rose to speak on a more contentious issue, welfare. Indonesia prided itself on a sustain for the teachings of Marx, sometimes to a fall. Essential services could sometimes be caught up in the big tent of communism, never to be seen again. Both parties agreed to frame the debate for the matter of the budget, not on whether or not welfare was good for the nation so as to not spark the ire of Sukarno. Olamo took the stance of granting more to towards the people, delivering speeches and detailing how services necessary for some to survive found their coffers drained, <clears throat> and spoke of the importance of a strong and robust safety net, pointing out that the people were only as strong as the assembly granted them to be. For maximum prosperity, people should be granted all they needed to thrive. Masumi once again took the side of the status quo, noting the importance of a balanced budget and a nation still getting its footing, swaying Sukarno towards, more towards temperance, promising that we w could leave the subject open to debate and re reviewed in the future when the economy proved itself worthy. Their speeches could only mean so much, and once again, it fell to Sukarno to decide if Indonesia would be receiving a safety net or a stable budget. 
Hmm. Conservative democracy could... Oh! If, oh, regardless, we get more conservative democracy. More monthly poverty change would be really beneficial. Who cares about the GDP, right? Or the cost? That's what I'm talking about, not GDP. Oh, the map bar's not so not bad. I mean, that, that doesn't really affect us that much at all. Wow, our national debt to G, total GDP is fucking not too good, though. Holy crap. But, hey, there's nothing we can really do about it, right? Let's expand the refineries. I want to get to taxation and liberty, too. Oh, lights, cameras, actions. Even in the far-flung corners of Asia, most had heard of the peak of American luxury where goddesses dazzle crowds with encapsulating performances. While the outside observer might tell you this is the peak of acting, any resident of Indonesia would happily correct them, knowing that the greatest actor performed in the assembly. There were two things in Indonesia nobody wanted to be. A politician and someone on the wrong side of Sakarno, although they often overlapped. The punishment for the former was doing your was your own doing, and people would choose to wake up every morning and decide to represent the community. In reality, very little representing would take place in Jakarta. When one passed through the gates of the assembly, he stepped not they stepped not only into the beautiful marble flooring, but straight onto the high wire. From then on, the challenge was not to sway the assembly to act at the will of the constituents, but to avoid sparking the ire of the director of the world's biggest act, Bong Karno. No one will be content with watching a boring performance, and it will only be a matter of time before they demand the government makes the real changes. This demands the coalition to clash every now and then, even if it's for the smallest issue, only to paint a picture of power is resting in the assembly. Cool. Oil is the lifeblood of Indonesia, the Japanese empire, and the world. President Sukarno knows that the fastest way to grow the economy is to expand the number of oil refineries. Survey teams will be dispatched across the island in search of even the slightest trace of black gold. Machinery and workers will soon follow after them. There will be sacrifices, of course, farms, towns, and cultural sites unfortunate enough to exist atop underground oil deposits, which will have to go, but President Sukarno knows what's best for Indonesia and won't let anyone, even his own people, get in his way. Yeah, even if we do that, we still don't get anything, any more civilian factors, which really just, really sucks. But hey, it is what it is. At least we have no interest on the debt. Hooray. Oh, there's a lot more conservative democracy support. Oh. Yeah, we don't want to increase that too much, so. Cool. Alright, so after that, taxation and liberty. President Sukarno has plans for Indonesia. Great plans that unfortunately require a correspondingly great amount of money. Thankfully, a golden opportunity has presented itself. The Indonesian middle class, still growing steadily despite years of instability, is both wealthy and a large liberal voting bloc. In order to cement loyalty among the lower classes and upper classes, fund future government projects, and strike a blow against opposing political parties, President Sukarno will kill three birds with one punitive tax rate. Low income weighted, flat taxes, we lose political power, we lose stability, and we get some more income rate. Not bad. And maybe we'll do a change of plans. Presidential decree, huh. Because for this, you need both sides of this. Oh no, you need one side. The oath. Honor above all else. A new generation. Huh. Party in Palembang. Huh. Okay. Well, we'll see. All right, flag posted up. After a busy day as president of the greatest country on earth, Sukarno leaned back in his chair with his hands interlocked behind his head. He propped his legs on the desk and crossed them. He looked at the clock and smiled. Five minutes more and he would be out of the door on his way to the biggest party in Jakarta. A night of sex, drugs, music, and gambling awaited him. He shuddered in anticipation. A knock sounded from his office door. Sukarno grumbled and returned his feet to the ground. Come in. An Najlatul Ulama representative quickly entered the room. His face beamed with excitement. Mr. President, I'm sure you've heard, but the new bridge was completed earlier than expected. In fact, we moved the opening ceremony to tonight. I thought it'd best inform you of the reschedule personally, given the short notice. What? President Sukarno interjected. He glanced at the clock. Three minutes. I thought the ceremony was tomorrow. Well, it was, Mr. President, but it's been moved, as I just explained, replied the representative with a pained smile. No, you don't understand, Sukarno said, shaking his head. I'm otherwise indisposed tonight. Ah, yes, a party. This opening is an important PR event. Your absence will give the press a lot of ammunition. I urge you to reconsider your plans for tonight. Sukarno's eyes looked towards the door. Two minutes. You can still make it out. The greatest party of his life was still in reach. I have a party to get to? Will the ceremony at least have drinks? Well, yeah, I think for this one, we have to go with this one, so... This will make we will make concessions to our politicians and other officials. Eh, the politicians though. Eh, it's still good to have PR. You still want to make sure that the people, the average person in Indonesia, still sees you and trying to you showing that you still support them. And a change of plan, shall we? With the truth revealed and the fear of the communists brought back in the forefront of the people's worries, it seems that the government must act for once. Take and take definitive action. President Sukarno spearheaded the initiative for military reform. Two options have been proposed. The first plan focuses exclusively on the army and is favored by the Japanese, but neglects the nascent air force and navy. The second plan is far more ambitious and seeks to overhaul the entire military. The final choice, final choice of course, is President Sukarno's. Wow. 0.9. 16%? Not bad. Uh, there's a lot of red here. So, yeah, that's not good. 
And hopefully we get another one up. But it's already July 13th, 1963. Nice. And now we're back down to 11. Oh, these things are not going down as harshly as they were. Academic base is looking okay. Research facilities, agriculture, pottery rate is looking slightly worse, which is not good. Industrial expertise, obviously industrial expertise and equipment, eh, they're not great. But it is what it is. I don't want to lose any more weekly stability, but we get more political power this way too. With the purge wrapping up, someone will have to fill desks, positions, and office necessary to run the government. Thanks to President Sakarno's previous investment in patriotic education. However, a new generation of Indonesians, vigilant against the dangers of communism and sedition, will rise to fill the ranks of paper pushers and dark-suited bureaucrats. Finally, President Sakarno, firmly control the state and the people, will lead Indonesia into a long-deserved golden age. Which is a great, great thing. Now, we only get now, once we do this one, a new generation. We only get 1% more weekly stability, but hey, at least we get 30% more political power, which... Yeah, we've dug ourselves quite a hole here with the lack of political power. Gotta love it. Especially with the coffee that we have in hand. Ah, change of plans, my friends. The Indonesian Armed Forces, or APRI, is a nascent military force having its origins in the Pembela Tana Air Battalions formed by the Japanese. This arrangement was ideal for both Sakarno and the Japanese. Indonesia gets a force large enough through which it could defend itself, and small enough so the Japanese would be able to keep tabs on what the Indonesian military is up to. At least, it seems ideal on the surface. In reality, though, the PETA battalions, which forms army cadres, are a little more than a poorly equipped garrison force. Even disregarding the lack of modern and quality equipment, the army's organizational structure of small br brigades and battalions make concerted efforts ineffective, especially against the battle-hardened communist rebels. Something has to be done, and surprisingly, Tokyo has already sent feelers signaling its approval for army reform. When it comes to the Navy and Air Force, however, Tokyo is a little more wary. Sakarno wants to expand Indonesia's power projection capabilities, ostensibly to exert greater military presence in the far-flung islands to the east, but Tokyo is wary of possible ulterior motives. Even ignoring Tokyo's secret disapproval of the plan, such as an, ex such an expansion, would place an even heavier burden on an already strained national budget. Sakarno knows, however, that his government is the only means for Japan to exert its influence south of the equator, and most importantly provides bases for operations in the South Pacific. This leverage is helpful, but a risky move nonetheless. Ultimately, the choice lies in its hands. Does Indonesia ask the Japanese to merely reform the army, or go above and beyond? We're the southern beacon of Pan-Asianism. We'll stay focused on rooting out these communists. I gotta do the top one. It's gotta do it. Oh, wow. This unlocks a whole lot more. A dispatch from Tokyo. Not just ours. <clears throat> um, board meeting. Whoa, this is way more than what I thought there was gonna be. Share the wealth. Ours alone. Seems like talking about wealth. A stable market would be kind of nice to get. Breaking up. Uh, we have that stuff removed. Um, our own company. All right, lock them up. A new thing. A party rate begins to improve. Ours to share. Increase security. Electrify the archipelago. Public education with subsidized higher education. Wow. Those are quite some things we can do here. I'm kind of excited for this. And what's in the middle one here? A full measure. More division organization. Me low spending with medium spending. The Air Force. Honor above all else. Uh, we might want that, maybe? The Army? Navy? Increases military expenditures, but you know, whatever. Daily command power gain, I guess. Land auction? Eh. That stuff seems okay. The Oath and Honor Above All Else. The Oath. Well, where's the Oath? Yeah. Completed focus, Honor Above All Else, or the Oath. There is no Oath focus. Um, Okay. Well, that's odd. Uh, dispatch from Tokyo. An inauspicious missive has arrived on our doorstep sent by the local hegemon, the Japanese. Tokyo's economic ministers have informed us of the trouble, some troubling developments in the Sunrise Kingdom, pertaining to an economic war source unfurling in Japan as rival factions of industrial elites compete for political and commercial influence. Any economic unrest inflicting such a powerful trading partner of ours is such to have a negative consequence for Indonesia, but perhaps there's a silver lining for us to find somewhere. The Shinkyu Tai, the Japanese conglomerate that manages the extraction and export of our national resources to Japan, is being left spiritless and languid by the competitive competition between its Japanese corporate backers. Their paralysis affords us an opportunity to make the, this conflict work in our favor. Hmm. Interesting. Big Brother, President Sukarno and General Suharto sat across from one another in the former's office. The early morning sunlight tore into the carpet despite the best effort of the heavy curtains. It was a familiar setting, and Su Suharto wasted very little time outlining his most recent excuse to command the army. Sukarno listened intently and politely waited for Suharto, Suharto to finish before giving constructive criticism. No, absolutely not. Suharto was accustomed to that response, but it was 
nothing if not persistent. Think of it as a normal exercise with just Japanese there as well. Why don't we just have our own then? There's no reason to conduct a joint military exercise with them. There are plenty of reasons. First, it improves our standings with Tokyo. Second, it's an opportunity to gauge their military capabilities. And third, I have a letter ready to send it to Japan tomorrow morning, expressing my sincere apology over the unwillingness of my head of state to engage in activities in pan-Asian unity. All the way to the top this time, huh? So hard to shrug it. It's really up to you. You think he'd go away? Fine, just make sure to burn that letter. This is probably going to be really bad for us. Not just ours. Try for reform. Entrenched Romusha. Strengthened. So, this seems like we want to go with them a lot. Ours to share. Hotline Tokyo. Electrify these guys. Minimal safety regulations. Um, More tax. More cost. Or ours alone. Shinkyutai Shattered. Wow. Consumer goods, minus 45%. Lock them up. A new deal. Uh, I kind of want to do either ours to share or ours alone. I don't think Japan's going to support us regardless of what we do, so... Economic Minister Suwiro's hands trembled as he handled the latest dispatch from Tokyo. His furtive eyes rapidly moved back and forth across the paper. His dry mouth recited the words with a carefully restrained panic across the table. President Sukarno, Vice President Hatton, General Suharto listened carefully, holding every word like a fragile, valuable glass figurine. He finally finished muttering the last unimportant political necessities or into a mumbled slur. The expensively furnished meeting room caked with a fine layer of dust. Was well, still in silence, save for the general turning of a ceiling fan, how to cut and began to speak. The growing economic instability in Japan and across the sphere clearly represents a. It represents an opportunity, so hard to interrupt him. An opportunity to, to assert ourselves. You're gosh darn right, it does, what Carno stated. This place implies implacable. And his eyes shadowed by the sunglasses, despite the fact the meeting was indoors. This is our chance to seize the SKM for the good of Indonesia. You mean total nationalization, so hard to ga gasped? Or gaped? I don't think that's necessary. We can pressure them and get a better deal now than we than we're no longer fresh out of war. Suero shook his head fiercely. The Japanese may seem weak now, but when this, he gestures to the pile of papers on the table. The crisis is, is over. They should have pleased us twice as hard as we do anything now. Miles away from the beckering figures, Hata kept his cool head, his head cool and mouth shut. Or that nothing he says will change a thing. They'll serve in Indonesia. We can't afford to anger the rising sun. Perhaps the compromise is in order. Ours to share, not just ours. Hmm. I like this one quite a bit. I really do subsidize higher education. But I also like a new deal. Hmm. Well, it doesn't really matter. So ours, not just ours. So this one means we we will not, uh, uh, well, not be too aggressive against them. Uh, work with them. That sounds like a compromise, maybe. Ours alone, so which means sounds like the SKN will serve in Indonesia. Or ours to share, we can't afford it. So th this, the one down here, the we can't afford to anger the rising sun seems like not just ours. A compromise in order means ours a share, probably. Uh, break up the SKN. Well, they're supporting us, and we want their support, so maybe ours a share. Compromise, maybe. Because that's SKN. Can't afford to anger them. So perhaps a compromise is in... Okay. Compromise. Wait, a compromise is in order. Um... All right, whatever. Ours alone. Now is the time to strike. The outbreak of the economic war is a spot of good fortune for us, making the ro robber barons that explore our country vulnerable to attack. Once we're done with them, foreign business will no longer hold the untold wealth of our country in their hand, greedy little hands. And the enormous riches of the resources of Indonesia shall go towards the benefit of Indonesians themselves. Our wealth shall be ours alone, of course. We'll still have to be clever about it. Overtly hostile actions against the staffers of the Shinku Tai may be both justified and popular, but it is also politically infeasible. We can't allow the failure of the SKN to aspire into an international incident, thankfully. We have plenty of mostly legal avenues to have attack to pursue our quest to rid of Indonesia's economy of foreign control. It's only a matter of being told or being bold enough to walk them. Yeah, th th that decision, the three decisions don't make a lot of sense. I mean, I guess we want the bottom option, I thought, and that should be like that one. The top one technically should be the one on the left, and the middle one should be the middle one, but <clears throat> whatever. Break up the SKM. Bye-bye, Shinkutai. Legislation is being drafted adjusting Indonesia's definition of monopoly to include organizations like the SKN and thereby enabling our judiciary to intervene and politically sunder the organization in its place. The various subdivisions of the SKN will act as independent entities in their own industries. They'll maintain many of their assets but lose the monopolistic control over the Indonesian economy they previously enjoyed as part of the SKM. To compete with these Japanese leftover companies, the Karno's government has set to work establishing a slew of new state-oriented enterprises. Governed by loyalists, the Sukarno means to gradually replace SKN's dominance over different sectors of the Indonesian economy. Some are, some are shell companies for now, lacking in real productive assets, but their circumstances may yet to change. Look at their political power. 
Is that really minus 166? Or is it minus 1660? Hmm. Ours alone. President Sicarno pounded his fist on the desk. <clears throat> the old sturdy wood shuddered from the impact. The SKN is a greatest shame. It's a monument to exploitation to our subservience to Tokyo. Now is our time to correct our mistake, and I can hear nothing but pitiful whimpering. Economic mis Minister Suiro and General Suharto stood side by side in front of the desk, neither the mood out of fear provoking a reaction. Sir, if I may, Suiro began, nationalization looks good from our perspective, but in the long run we risk the risk of economic depression and instability, not to mention the ire of the Japanese. He pointed to a folder on the president's desk. If you just read the report I've assembled. We don't need a report right now. <clears throat> oh, my apologies about that. A uh, report to know the Japanese are raping Indonesia, Suharto interjected. Mr. President, give me the authority I need to adjust the SKN, and I promise you that you won't be disappointed. He flashed his best winning smile. Sukarno look, looked between the two men and stood up. It's clear that neither of you will be any help. He walked around the desk and out the front office door. I'll take this issue to the people. As the door slammed shut, Suharto and Suwiro exchanged worried looks. This could end quite badly for us. Probably. Breaking up the SKN. Down with the Japanese, down with the SKN. Waving Indonesian flags in Transville, Jakarta, thousands of people roused to action by the president flood the streets. Their anger bleeds the air. Sukarno, king of the mob, gives a speech after tirade denouncing the SKN, the Japanese exploitation of Indonesia. As rage fuels the crowd, they feed off his virile worlds like maggots on a dead horse. The people are the hand of Sukarno. He flexes and contracts him like a muscle, the language of the riot clearer than any other. Gives the powers that be little choice. By the end of the day, President Sukarno's latest decree, classifying the SKN as an illegal monopoly, passes unopposed. The people with a little assistance have spoken. So, we have just done a break up the SKN. Um, and it looks like this, our own company, is actually the same exact text as... Yeah, it's the exact same text as our own company. Breaking up. Wow, okay, well. At least this is a little better, synthetic oil production, so that's not too bad. So, there's nothing to read it there, but lock them up. Though the villainous SKM may be gone, many of its former board members are still remaining in Indonesia. It would be prudent of us to rid of them as soon as we can. One strategy. Useful both as a symbolic propaganda tool to legitimize the break of the SKN as well as because of its reasonable judicial grounding, as to try the worst try the worst of them for corruption, while maintain a monopoly on resource extraction in Indonesia. The businessman in charge of the SKN doubt in all kinds of illegal activities, embezzlement, and bribery, only some among them. It won't be hard to find real evidence of misdeeds for many of them, and for the rest, something can be invented easily enough. Man, the world is just falling apart here, isn't it? But we wouldn't want we wouldn't like to you know if the world wasn't falling apart. Ah, so that would be more nice. And, oh, 18 days left. Wow, that's quite a few days. We were, we left for that, which is totally fine. Not bad. We still have, oh, look at all that manpower. Oh, we're demobilizing because we cut military spending, but... And it increases budget some more, but hey, it is what it is. Golden teeth, dead men. A paper beast of ink and secrets lounged peacefully on the desk of the President Sicarno. He examined the sprawled out files and documents, moving them around gently in an effort to avoid paperclip claws. Eventually, he reached the beating black heart of the animal as a priest to a sacrificial lamb. He ripped it out, black blood stained his desk, but at last, divine the truth. From between the lower right county buck and upper ventricle of the tax return, Sicarno excised conspiracy. Using a combination of tax loopholes and the self-interest of public officials, a cabal of Japanese industrials have used the state of Indonesia as a means of laundering money from illegal yet tolerated businesses across the sphere. Drugs, human trafficking, arms yielded great, but yet dirty quantities of money. It had to be washed somehow, and Indonesia was the place to do it. Sukarno reached for the telephone. Quick, one quick call on the Japanese businessman, and the solely profits would be gone. His hands paused. It was a lot of money to be sure. He looked at the vivisected paper creature. He wondered how much that information was worth to them. Indonesia could always use more money, after all. It didn't really matter where it came from as long as it ended up in the right place. Means and ends, all for Indonesia? Justice is absolute. Eradicate SKA and control our economy. Well, it's looking like. If we do this one, justice is absolute. We're working for the people, right? Really for Sakarno, but you know. Alright, the Ulam is fully supporting. Favorable, favorable. Beloved, favorable, disregarded. As long as Sakarno is beloved, you know. That's probably the most important thing. That GDP, debt to GDP. The deficit to income ratio. Oh boy. Our own company. The party was a hustle boss of rich attire and smooth faces that never known the want or stress. President Sicarno stood in the middle of it all, Vice President Hada conspicuously silent or absent. He waved and smiled at the passing guests. His welcome was sincere. These people had a lot to offer him. Every person in the room with him was an accomplished, prominent businessman. More importantly, they were all Indonesian. Following the nationalization and subsequent breakup of the SKN, his bastard orphan child had to go somewhere. 
were better than the infant Indonesian capitalist class. So Kono tapped his champagne glass with a spoon he had been saving in his pocket for the specific purpose. Friends, Indonesians, we stand on the precipice of a new age of our nation. With the breakup of the illegal SKN, the subversion of Japanese influence, we can finally achieve our great golden destiny. I am comforted greatly knowing that Indonesia's prosperity lies with such committed heroes, loyal to Indonesia above all else. With this, Sukarno spoke perhaps a bit too loudly and smiled perhaps a little too brightly and held his drink perhaps a little too tightly. Polite applause followed, but all understood the innuendo. Loyalty to Indonesia was loyalty to Sukarno. Resistance was ill-advised. As the party wore on, Sukarno grew irritable. Where was Hatta? He, would, he said he would be here. At the end of the other room, a police Suharto counted his lucky stars. The liberal fool of a vice president had inspected his invitation too closely. It's all coming together now. And would you look at that? We still have a crap ton of deficit of political power. Oh well. Next, next research will be done in two weeks, which is not bad, but a new deal. With a newly created and asset stuff state owned companies replacing the SKN's dominance over Indonesia's primary sector economy, our government is blessed with an overflow of new revenue. Those Japanese were milking Indonesia dry for a reason, they must have been making a fortune. The people of our country will expect to share in this new wealth now, of course, and we see now good reason to deny them. We see now no good reason to, to deny them. So Cardinal shall usher in a new deal for the Indonesian man, a deal where the state looks out for its people and intervenes through a certain centrally funded welfare state to protect them from the worst harms of society and keep the poor housed and fed. We're looking today not only at a windfall of revenue, but at a new exciting age for the people of Indonesia. Poverty rate will go up a little bit better, thank goodness. All for the Indonesian people. A date night, oh boy. President Sukarno, uh threw his rifle through his closet. Or riffled through his closet. Uh, he shuffled papers of monochromatic suits like a deck of playing cards. Eventually, he narrowed his choice down to two indis indistinguishable shades of white. He held one suit in each hand and compared them in the evening sunlight passing through his bedroom window. A knock on the door interrupted his considerations. He sighed and placed both suits on his bed side by side like the graves of spouses. Come in, he rebocalized, edging his words with a displeasure. A sheepish military officer dressed in a prim and proper uniform marched in and promptly saluted before handing Sukarno a note. Sukarno glanced over the paper and absentmindedly dismissed the messenger with a wave of the hand. The note was an invitation to the military officer's banquet that evening. Sukarno rubbed the bridge of his nose. His annoyance arose both out of the abruptness of the invitation as well as the conflict it created. He had planned to take one of his wives, Dewey, to dinner at an expensive Japanese restaurant. The reservation had been made a month in advance, and his, even his position as president did not guarantee another opening for at least another. He, they had both been looking forward to it. He knew that Dewey planned to wear a brand new dress she had ordered from Tokyo. He hoped it was red. She looked beautiful in red. <laughs> Sukarno glanced back at the two suits on the bed. Unlike before, they seemed completely identical. Business becomes before pleasure. Tonight's date night, business. We gotta do business. I'm sorry, wifey, or one of my wifeys, but whatever. A deficit of imagination. Numbers, taxes, graphs, and lines. Short spirits and long runs. Economic jargon concerning the latest budget proposal. The gr proposal ground the conversation into a dry monotony. President Sukarno was bored out of his wits. Eventually, the coalition finished her entirely superfluous discussion and passed the proposed budget tool. Idle chatter picked up as they awaited the final rubber stamp. Sukarno examined the proposal. It was nearly identical to the previous one. It was under ambitious, safe, and cautionary. Everything he wasn't. This budget leaves much to be desired, he stated absentmindedly. The infinite dialogues died in the cribs. If we make several adjustments, we can see a greater potential for economic growth and government efficiency. It won't take much, just Sukarno quickly scribbled out several notes on the document with a nearby pen. That should be about it. The modified budget was passed around the room. The ensuing debate took on a sincerity that the previous lacked. It's our humble opinion, Mr. Ms. President, that your plans are simply too ambitious, said the senior representative. It's the risk that we can't take. What are we going to do if this plan fails? Mutters of agreement and occasional dissent filled the air. So Karnoff felt the room turn against him as he prepared his response. You are right, we can't afford to take risks now. We may not have the will to make Indonesia great, but I do. Uh, politicians and other officials? Nope. An evening drink. It was putrid, a gross gaggle, grotesque commoners, high off their own fumes, having forgotten the chain of command, having failed to see the catastrophic blunders of the PKI and of the popular movement at large. It should be apparent, it should be clear. There is a ruler and the ruled. As Francus swirled the wine in its glass, he had no doubt that the police would be quick to shut down this disgusting display of indignity and self-aggrandizement. Self aggrandiz After all, the police carried a hefty price tag and he wasn't about to let his money go to waste. They could barely witness... They could bear witness to the demonstration no longer, slamming the sh shutters with a thud. Franciscus retreated to the gargantuan lavender chair that awaited a man of the upper crust such as himself in the study. He sifted his wine, darn it, it had gone better. Maybe rather, it, he had grown bitter. High atop his ivory tower, it was easy to forget that he could have ended up like them, if it had not been for his adoption into the family status. 
Franciscus could not find his inclusion in the crowd unfathomable. It wasn't reality, however, he was not like them anyway. I anyway, savages. A clink at the window. Someone had thrown something at them. Uh, the roars of the crowd grew louder. Someone had, had a microphone. The heat from the sheer number of bodies made him tug at his collar. The police had nothing. Had done nothing. <clears throat> Slowly rose from the seat. His toes intertwined with the silk carpet, and ever so gently pulled back the curtain. The sight was something out of any rich man's horror story. Thousands of bodies of hearts and minds dead set on the destruction of your livelihood. Franciscus shuddered in the middle of it all. Atop a freshly erected platform, he could easily make out the shape of Shikarno. His finger thrust it into the air, chanting something he couldn't quite hear. Perhaps if he opened the window. <clears throat> a rock jagged and heavy made contact with his head in an instant, sending him stumbling back, collapsed in a mass of broken glass and blood. Forward, he heard, the mahogany door of the entrance thumped and fell to the floor as the overwhelming strength of the people. As his vision faded to black, it became clear a double plague infested his home, infested Indonesian society at large, populism. Nothing can stop the people. And then a new deal, which is very, very nice. Whoa. Now, now that's a little bit of lag, but happy 1964, everyone. Hope you're having a great year. A stable market? Sure. With the matter of Shinkyu Tai resolved, we have finished reaping the rewards sow sowed by the Japanese in our economy. With domestic production under our control, the government and people alike feel much more comfortable opening up the economy to further outside trade and investments. Tokyo may still be grappling with this economic war, but in Indonesia, a new strong Indonesia, has finished taking its advantage of the crisis. Is everything all right, Alia? It didn't make much sense to him. There were no man rivals yet. Uh Ibu and Aya went wept in the doorway. Respati tossed a rubber ball between his hands, flinging it from one side to another. He wanted to eat. They all wanted to eat, of course, but this was special. His mother had promised to split from yet another typical night of rice and tempah and make satay. Satay. Were they crying because they could not contain their excitement for dinner? <clears throat> he must have been distracted from his own thoughts. The ball was in his hand one moment, and then what? What well, wasn't? He watched in what seemed to be slow motion as the ball hurled towards the back of his father's head. Oh, Allah save him. His dad was not a nice man when crying. When he got back from work in the evening, Ayah would do the same thing, bang his head against the wall and just cry. The ball made contact, and his father whipped around. Raspati prepared himself for a beating, ready for the fist to fly, eyes closed, shrinking into its own skin. He waited for a moment, and another, and another, and nothing ever came. Cautiously, he ever so slightly opened... One eye to see. His father smiling. It didn't make him. Didn't make sense to be crying and happy at the same time at all. Why were grown ups so weird? It's okay. His father spoke softly, using his form to dry his eyes. Aya was holding something in his hand. A paper plastered full with pictures of Bung Karno. Had Bung died? That would be a good reason to cry. Sure, his dad wouldn't be smiling if that was the case. Aya, what's happening? Why are you crying? He asked. Things are going to be easier from now on. Whew. Good. And so we finish this part up. We might as well do some of this stuff. So a full measure. The reformation of the military is not a test that can be e given to some low-level bureaucrat or half-bootied by a politically savvy general. The Indonesian army demanded to be one that was feared not just left to the wayside as a home defense force. In order to achieve this goal, the entirety of the armed forces would need to be reviewed from the airports to the army to the navy. No stone can be left unturned. If Indonesia is going to be on par with their Asian allies, if Indonesia is going to be, on, uh, it would be need more than just a massive disorganized militia. So Karno will spare no sacrifice to make sure that the Indonesian army is not just feared but also revered. revered. <clears throat> Good. Palpable rage. When Sukarno saw Muhammad Hatta sit across from him, he would not describe him as a kind or a teacher, as kind or a teacher, as so he commonly was. He sensed rage. He felt the disdain seep out of his eyes and begin to fill the room, drowning Sukarno in the hate that, could not, that he cannot comprehend. Have I wronged you? Hatta struck first, his tone authoritative. Help me understand what did I do? Sukarno failed to stifle a smile. How could he? What was he on about? Hatta, I, I guess I don't understand. You come into my office and plop yourself down in this chair and sulk why. You know if you read my letters or met met me were planned, or even answered the darn phone. Hata slammed the table and rose from his seat, his nostrils flaring as he huffed and puffed. So Karno rose st slowly from his seat, pushing back the chair and placed one hand on the shoulder of his vice president and friend. Hata, believe me when I say I have no idea what you're talking about. I've noticed your absence, but I assume you're simply on vacation. Vacation? Hata chewed on the word as he focused his eyes on the man across him. I don't understand. Well, then, you haven't gotten a single letter? So Karno shook his head. Well, I suppose, Hata gently returned to his seat, I suppose I don't understand. Seeing Hata's confusion chipped away, so Karno's lightheaded demeanor generally confused him. I don't either, he said. His booming voice rendered a little more than a weak whisper. The two stared a long time at each other, speaking a silent language. If Sukarno wasn't subverting Hata, and Hata wasn't dodging Sukarno, something someone else was. Neither knew who was, and frankly, neither wanted to. The thought alone shook both of them to the very cores. Well, welcome. Welcome back? Hmm, seems like there's trouble afoot. That is not good for the security of this nation. But at the same time, we still can't build a jack squat, which really just got awful. And we still have a massive deficit of political power, but hey. What else is new in Indonesia? The Air Force, the Army, 
I think I want to do the army just because that's probably the most important part here. When the Japanese come, came to Indonesia as part of the Grand Crusade against Western imperialism, they did not find a united front of the oppressed ready to throw off the shackles of the Dutch and the West at large. No, instead what the IJA was greeted was with was a hodgepodge of different groups fighting the Dutch, Japanese, and themselves. Under Sukarno's leadership, much of the armies followed into line, but the fact remains that the Indonesian army does not instill fear it ought to, excluding the communist menace. Sukarno. Considers Indonesia too grand of a project with too much potential to just let it nap at the foot of the Japanese. The army should give the Americans second thought before attempting to recolonize Asia, but the militias will be blown away by the overwhelming force of American ingenuity if the necessary reforms aren't made. Very much, yes. Man, of whose word? And that's why there will be major changes immediately. The SKN is exploitive and criminal. It has no place in Indonesia's future. By the end of the week, I plan to introduce several laws that will severely curtail the privileges granted to the Japanese corporations and instead favor native Indonesian businesses. Furthermore, outside of the recording room, aides and advisors scramble to and fro in the insectal panic. Did you shut it off, screen one? Yeah, but I'm not sure how much got out, wailed another. An hour later, an irate President Sukarno sat beside the shaking economic minister Suwiro. You can't just do that, Mr. President, and why not? Because SKN is Indonesia, whether you like it or not. Piss him off and every everything goes to crap. Suwiro ran his hands down his face and sighed. Your pr impromptu address got out and there's nothing we can do about it. But the reforms hardly need to be as extensive as you promised. Throw the people a bone now and grab it back later when they're not looking. I deliver my promises. Uh, well, I mean, technically they're under us, so... They're already under us, right? So, nice edge. With all due respect, Mr. President, General Nasushin spat through gritted uh, teeth. The army requires more funding in order to accomplish the goals you laid out. Every dead comes, costs us men, equipment, and money. We simply need more. President Sukarno meet Nasushin's eyes and flashed a colonel's frown. He gripped the edge of the table and stood up to match his general's masculine posturing. You will carry out your orders regardless of how much my money I decide that you will receive, Sukarno replied slowly, emphasizing every pronoun and possessive adjective. There's nothing further to discuss. You're dismissed. You think you're all-powerful, don't you? Nasushin said, as well as staying with the violence. Don't let your title go to your head, Mr. President. Something else might get there first. Sukarno paused. He felt his body suddenly grow cold. Sweat formed across his back, and his armpits and across his forehead. Nasushin was threatening him. More than that, the threat had an honesty behind it. He did not expect from his general. He chose his next words carefully. Show up your funding. Just keep spending. No one needs to know how much debt we're in. Nice. Full measure. Ooh, anti-tank. Nice. Very cool. Anti-tank, basic anti-tank, gets better improved anti-tank. Very nice. I very con gets control. Cool. Who's actually leading all this group? I don't know any of these people, but if you guys do, that'd be kind of cool. Jean Bicholon, elected president of France. All right. Sukarno's leading, barely. Cool, full measure. The army, my friends. Yeah, I gotta make sure the army's pretty, doing pretty well. Sander has equipment. Yeah, we still can't do that one, so. The former oil lords of Jakarta utilized Indonesia as a bank, a mere resource to be tapped into, forcing Indonesians into factories, working them to the bone and rubber extraction sites. It's no wonder that when granted the chance, the people quickly took up arms against the United East India Company. The means of the revolt, the weapons used, were scarce, and so many took to looting from the dead officers using Dutch weapons against them. It's been two decades since then, and yet an inspection of the troops. Sukarno noticed the same firearms of his past. Worse so, among the men using outdated rifles, some cluttered, clutched weapons typical of the Americans. To put icing on the cake, few and far between stood at the attention with Japanese guns. This system is untenable and sure to cause chaos in the battlefield. All Indonesians should carry the same shield against tyranny. Increased military expenditures, whatever, with large spending. And we get a pretty good bonus for in, uh, infantry weapons, which is not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, naval XP, destroyers... Large spending. We're going to be spending a lot of money here. Holy cow. Standardized equipment, though, which we're looking at. Change out the old guard. Yeah, that'd probably be good. And buy Japanese drill instructors. That'd actually be pretty good, too. So. Wow. Ustase defeated. Cool. This is looking like a mess. But then again, it is Germany, so what do you expect? We'll get two political power today. That's not bad. All right. Standardize the equipment. I think it's probably a good idea to uh, change out the old guard. When it became clear that Sukarno's faction would be the one to unite the archipelago, more underground figures quickly defected to the winning side, hoping to get a slice of the victory pot, like weeds. They rooted deep into the virgining nation. Virgining nation, yeah. Utilizing their opportunism to climb the ranks, not on the merit of skill, but because people were needed and beggars could not be choosers. These kleptocrats have grown fat and content at the top of the hierarchy, thinking that Sukarno would shrug off the lack of improvement in the army. How foolish they are to assume that Sukarno would sit idly by while the army gathers dust. It's high time that the incompetent retired from all future service. We get more planning speed, daily command power gain, uh, maximum command power increase. Not much, but 20 is still pretty nice. 
I'm, I'm not even focusing on the line doctrine at all, which is probably a mistake. But it looks like the Kingdom of England is doing really well against the Hemler. Oh, boy. Oh, yep. And I called it. Who's eating uh, the U.S.? Is it LBJ? No, it's still Nixon. Still Tricky Dick. It's only 1964. Cool. And we still can't build Jack Squat. Oh, we got a long time for this stuff, though. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, we're looking slightly better on some things. Not great, though. Still, just not great. Uh, there was a comment saying that I should try out the Republic of China sometime soon. Yeah, I, I'll get there eventually. I'm just not sure when, but I know that's going to be a really long campaign because China's got a lot of content. Uh, also, someone recommends we try out Seo Nan Po. So, I guess it's, you know, Singapore. So, eventually. I will eventually play as Singapore. But only if they get the unique focus tree. They currently do not. Omar Ali Sufudlian III. The Royal Poet. Okay, that's cool. Of course, they're in the Cobra Spirit Sphere like us, which is pretty nice. But, oh well. They don't have anything unique for now. <clears throat> in time, maybe. Invite Japanese drill instructors. And we need all the following. Okay. Much as Karno's uh, chagrin, as un is a universally known fact that the Japanese are the undisputed hegemon of Asia. It was the Japanese who first stirred the anti colonialist plot pot when they defied Russia entering Manchuria nearly a century ago. When the Chinese dynasties faltered under the weight of the mu Western might, the Japanese proved their capacity to send Uncle Sam packing along with his cronies in Britannia and Mariana with their tails between their legs. When the Japanese reached Indonesia, it was their experience that gave the final push to exile the Dutch. When the bomb was dropped in Hawaii, it became clear Asia was no longer the playground of the West. Yet, that does not stop America from attempting to sway our politics and tossing the country into chaos. If Americans won a round two, we'll be ready, prepared by the best of the best, the most experienced in crushing and dismantling the, dis the illusion of Western supremacy, the Japanese. Cool, we get a bunch of land auction, which we probably should really, uh, Probably focus on a little bit more. Nice. And the navy for the destroyer. Oh, military austerity. Cool. Well, it's only money, so keep spending. The Air Force. In the days of colon, colon, colonization, nations would fear the might of the naval, rival, naval power, sometimes dumping millions into their navy just to prevent their enemies from getting the upper hand due to the power of a boat. A navy could prevent the passage of goods, reinforce garrisons at every corner of the globe, and leave an opponent defenseless to invasion. Naval power proved important in the First World War, but as the engineers of the great powers turned their eyes to the heavens, it became clear that the battles of the next generation would be decided not from the sea, but from the sky. Indonesia has never been a nation of the air, seeing very little aerial combat, leading to some figures in the military growing complacent with the Paper Tiger Air Force. Sukarno was smart enough to see the changing tides, watching how the Germans kept their foot on the throat of Russia and Africa by utilizing planes. Perhaps, ponder Sukarno, the rebels of Indonesia would cease their attacks if they saw a bomb hurtling down towards them. Hey, maybe. Actually, we could probably edit our divisions a little bit more, but we don't have enough guns for Jack Squat, so. Oh, Bash Kurdistan's gone. Yeah, people are just dying and killing each other off. But what else is new in the history of mankind? And we actually do this stuff, do this stuff, a lot of this stuff done soon, too. That dad's not looking good, though. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, I don't like that. Pertamina. Huh. All right. Oh, poor Hadrish. Man, I kind of want to see Hadrish win actually by himself. But then again, that would just end the game probably, so... Or potentially, maybe not, actually. Purchasing new planes. It was a long process of challenging boundaries of what the humans could achieve when the Americans first achieved flight. It was after years of trial and error built off centuries of humanity's greatest minds devoting their lives to achieving flight. It hadn't been... Smooth sailing since, designs have resulted in failure, and prototypes winding up a smoldering pile of metal after wasting countless state resources. Unfortunately, even if we wanted to, the fact is that many of the leading technicians have taken shelter in Japan to expand on their ideas. Not only that, but why bother risking failure when the budget is tight and resources can be better utilized elsewhere? Ensuring quality and removing the risk of failure. Ordering top off the line air technology would prove much better for Indonesia. Just buy it off other people. Cool. So, yeah, incumbent. Ooh, that's still not good. Well, when we hire Japanese foreign instructors, oh, go spare. Uh, we should be able to increase our army professionalism, right? Party rate's slowly going up. Nice! Slightly, slightly getting better and better. Everything else is, well, not going up very much. But hey, what else is new? In about a week, we'll have that done, which would be nice. And actually, we'll get that done first. So, after this one, we'll probably go ahead and do some 1962 guns and be at the forefront of weapon improvements. Even though we have no land doctrine. And uh, not a great industry, but hey, we're doing what we can with what we have. Good. 
Just buy new planes. Or we get blueprints. We're not even buying them. The jungle. The telephone in the President Sukarno's desk rang, rang at once. Sukarno lifted his gaze from the newspaper in front of him and it settled on the cacophonous piece of machinery. It was rang a second time. Sukarno tilted his head, regarding it like a wounded, wailing animal. As it rang for the third time, the scream was quite short as Sukarno picked up the phone and held it to his head. Hello? He asked, although he knew perfectly well who was calling him what. Ah, President Sukarno, it's a miss. It's Mr. Ito calling again about the photo shoot we discussed earlier. I trust we're still set for tomorrow at noon. A slight quiver in his voice betrayed his anxiety. Sukarno looked back at the newspaper in front of him. SKN Savagery, 18 hours, days, workers on strike. He paused as he read, forcing Mr. Ito to wait in uncomfortable silence. I actually want to discuss that. Finally, replying Sukarno, given the recent scandal at your employer's factory, I don't think that a presidential photo op sends a good message to the public. Oh, yes, that, sighed Mr. Ito. It is regrettable. My employer has invested a great deal of money in this project. He has plans to open more factories, which, as I'm sure you're aware, will employ a great many people for the construction and operation. He paused, but plans could change, Mr. President. That there'll be tomorrow at noon? Um, it doesn't really matter. Too much. I have to cancel. Uh, yeah, this is for the workers, right? We already have I'm a lock, but Mr. Indonesia, I will take up the front car, and you can take the take up the back. Why would I agree to that? It was a hot day in Jakarta. Most people were spending the day outside the streets, vainly attempting to escape the oppressive heat, with everyone milling about. It was a perfect day for a military parade. The back car is more expensive. It suits your taste better. No, I'm taking the front. Even hotter than the midday air, tensions between the President Sukarno and his President Nasushin flared over the matter of position in a long line of soldiers and cars. The front car was a coveted position. It was the first thing that adorned masses saw. Its occupant could make blazing speeches and whip the people into a fervor before the heat wore them out. All right, you can have the front. Just don't say anything. Don't say anything. Yeah, just stay quiet. Leave the speeches to me. Sukarno looked up, looked him up and down. He could be serious, but his half-pleading, half-demanding expression said otherwise. Just as long as I get to the front, I don't care what you say. Lead your petty circus. I can draw my own crowd. Just further integrate the military. Airfields and radars. What good is a modern air force without the ground to land on? The landing ships of Indonesia are few, mostly due to the thick jungles and lack of, of uh, proper effort put on or put in by lazy previous military staff. Sukarno's push for modernization has been a wake-up call to all. Not only are more landing ships required for the existing air force, but as planes from Tokyo rolled off the assembly line, additional hangars, aircraft hangars, will be required to house them. Within the assembly, concerns have been raised about whether the budget can accommodate this expansion as Sukarno shoots down the naysayers. Oh, with ex ex expansion. Sukarno shoots down the naysayers, decrying them as wanting to hold Indonesia back, and goes one step further, giving the green light for radar installations and air bases uh, on bases as well. Whatever the price may be, nothing is more paramount than the safety of the people. Nice. We actually get two radar, oh, one radar station and two air bases. That's actually kind of nice. It all costs money, but hey, <clears throat> money means nothing to Sukarno. Spend, spend, spend. Now, come on, let's go. Cool. 11 days, not bad. We have enough time to read about the Navy. When the governing archipelago comprises some of the world's largest islands and topping the charts for a number of island chains, not everything that follows to the whims of the central authority. No one, like in Japan or America, where one could walk the majority of their territory, Indonesia demands a Navy not just for offense, but simply to survive. A message from the Kent Pate. No need to pay attention to the subversive elements. Oh boy. I'll say the vital administrative role of the Navy. Asia remains frozen in a narrow peace. Should it be broken, the bulk of combat will take place between the navies of the Rising Sun and the American Eagle. What the Americans might have in numerical superiority, what they lack is solidarity. Canada would never spend a healthy share of their GDP on the Navy to challenge Japan because America is already filling that role. Japan may guard Pan-Asianism on the seas, but why should they fight alone? Sakarno's plan for naval reform is two-pronged, safety at home and safety abroad. Nice. Now we have the best weapons improvements, the latest weapon improvements from the current year. Hopefully with some Japanese uh, uh, industrial know-how. Actually, let's take a look at this. Oh, a little bit of lag, and... Oh, well, hold on. Hello. Why do we go to America? Very odd. But okay. Oh, Margaret Thatcher. Hello. Well, that is quite the sphere, I'd say. I said the neighbor is in the OFN, so we gotta be worried about them. Oh, those Aussies. Oh, those Aussies. Nice. Consequences. The president of Indonesia entered his office in a creased suit. His copia draped precariously over his head. Last night his drink got too out of hand, and now he nursed over a pulsating, pounding pain in his head and a blaze in his throat. 
He could veritably breathe fire or bad breath, probably the latter. Settling down on his office desk, he poured over the day's litany of busy work. He shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too much. A lunch with Nas Nasir Hezbollah, the two capitals of the three-headed coalition, perched on top of his agenda. Sum Sumarna and Sumarni entered the room, dragging her high-heeled cho shoes through the flaming red and batik pattern rug. The sinuous curse seemed to follow her every step. Lunch is canceled, sir, she said. Both Mr. Nasir and Hezbollah have claimed to be ill. That was strange. How probable was it that the two of his government's most crucial key and sick men and men be sick on the same day at the same hour? Hand me the phone, he said, his nostrils flaring as if latching onto a hitherto, a hitherto unknown smell of rot. I want to talk to them. He dialed their numbers and waited. No answers, only long buzzing on the phone lines. Meanwhile, the Itsana descended into chaos. Ministers failed to appear, leaving their departments running headless as busy work detonated into outright collapse. The coalition was off. So Colonel took his hand, glided, hangover, addled mine aside, and thought, where did it all go wrong? Where did I go wrong? He didn't go wrong anywhere. It's all those stupid politicians screwing things up for everyone. Right? Totally. Oh, can't wait till things fall apart. Ah, airfields and radar. And then we have quite a few days for that. Quite a few weeks. Interdiction and protection. Boats are to an Indonesian what beer is to a German. I would not stand here. You would not. None of us would. It had it not been for the safe seafaring nature engraved into our spirit. Sukarno thunders from atop the assembly, urging them to soften the grip on the national pur purchase or purse, and <clears throat> continue to fund Sukarno's ambitious plans to transform Indonesia into a suitable successor to the title of he Naval Hegemon of Asia. Mr. President, the suit cry, where will we find the funds? Sukarno only needs a small reply. How will we fund the arms to remove the American boot off our neck if we do not? Cool. Seems like things are slowly, slowly falling apart. Now, the politi politicians don't like us, but that's okay. And they still support us. Nice. We've worked through a lot of political power here. Like, we get 2.61 a day. Gosh darn, that's a lot. Holy cow. That is so much. I really wish we could help our economy out, though. But societal development is still improving, which is kind of nice. A lot of support for social democracy, though. Hmm. All right. Suwiro, as well as Abdul Haris Nasushin. More daily political power, less crucial population factor, but that's okay. And rejuvenated shipyards. Boneless, they call it. A fruitless endeavor, they said. The largest west of resources spent by Sukarno towards the bustling shipyards of Indonesia. Any doubt that it once taken root in his mind is fizzled into nothing but yen signs. The ships prepared to depart for naval exercises with the Japanese while shipping containers brandishing flags from across the globe dock in Jakarta to receive premium goods not found anywhere else in the sphere. Nice. Two more naval dockyards and a walk. She's going to just going to read on above all else. Looking at the sorry state of the Indonesian armed forces just a few years prior, the average soldier would not be wrong to assume that the modern Indonesian state was a decrepit, self-serving entity. When even those would lay down their lives for the protection of their fellow countrymen, something has gone terribly wrong, and it fails for the president to fix it. And what does the cardinal do? What he always does, he builds. He starts by building with the nation himself, a daunting task for one man alone. It was then he may have lost his way, becoming more complacent with the corruption plague in the army. As the papers would tell you, that's far from the truth. Sukarno was not lazy. He did not sit idly by while the army twisted and contorted into an amalgamation al amalg of different generals looking for power. No, the president instead lured the traitors out from every level of Indonesian society and their dignity to the na army, navy, and the air force. But I think that's going to conclude today's episode, in which tomorrow we're probably going to explode. But regardless, if you enjoyed today's episode and us reading about Indonesia, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will probably really explode and have a good time trying to reunite our country. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.